This is um, something r really different from anything that I've ever had to preach that the Lord has given me. And um, I want to make sure and do it right. And um, so I hope that you'll keep praying with me as, as this comes forward. Um, I don't want to sound mean. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but I know that this is for me just as much as it is for anybody else. So if you will turn with me, I'm going to start in Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23, I'm going to start with verse 38, and some of the things that Brother Proctor said yesterday while he was preaching um, were continually coming to my mind today as the Lord was moving, you know, working this out in my mind, and um, he had an awesome message, and I'm sure that I'll be referring to that, so some of you might get a double portion of uh, what Brother Proctor said, so... Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 38. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, they then came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. When they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And I want to talk to you today about unholy sacrifices. Unholy sacrifices, if you will pray with me. Lord, we love you and thank you so much for what you've done here for the Spirit and for preparing us for this word, Jesus. I ask that you'll give me the wisdom, Lord, the word, the love that I need to deliver your word, Jesus, to your people, Lord, for myself to understand and have a better understanding of your word, Jesus, to help to help these people, Lord, have a deeper understanding of what you would have me to say, Lord Jesus, of your wonderful word, Jesus. We thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to be here and to be a part of this, Lord. You are wonderful, Jesus. You are holy, Lord. And everybody said, in Jesus, name in Jesus name amen um, there's a um, passage in the Bible that talks about how at um, a certain tribe had a fire um, and some scientists and, and different people who look back at this they think that this has something to do with maybe some sort of volcanic activity or or something like that but um, where they would sacrifice their children to that and um, in the Old Testament, there was an issue where um, I'm pretty sure it was a son of Judah after Judah had left Israel. And um, one, of his, one of Judah's sons had gotten married, and he stood up and said that his first child would be sacrificed to a false god. And the Lord killed him. And so the, the, the woman had to marry the second son. And he said that he would carry out what his brother had promised, and the Lord killed him. And then the third son refused to have a child with her, and he died. <laughs> and she wound up um, going in, I'm pretty sure it was to Judah, wasn't it? And um, dressed as a harlot and, and wound up um, carrying out the promise, according to the law, um, to continue the line of Judah. Um, and so in the Bible, there have been instances where the Bible talked about human sacrifice. Um, and, the, and the only time that that ever came close to um, anybody in the realm as far as Israel um, sacrificing their children was when Isaac did so. Um, or, excuse me, when Abraham took Isaac up onto the mountain. And the Lord um, said, you know, you're going to sacrifice your son today. And he took his son up onto the mountain and, and raised that dagger. But before that happened, the Bible says that an angel stilled his arm and he saw the ram in the bush. And so we know in our lives that as far as death is concerned, the Lord has never required a human sacrifice of death. Right. Except for when he himself died for us. Because our blood is tainted. There's nothing we can do to provide that atoning blood that would help save us. Amen. Starting all the way back in, in um, the book of Genesis and in the Garden of Eden, when Abraham messed that up for us. And so Jesus had perfect blood. God himself came and made a body and lived a perfect life so that perfect blood could be shed for us. But as far as we go, the only human sacrifice the Lord wants today is a living sacrifice. Right. He wants your whole life Hallelujah. in life. He does not want anybody to kill for him um, or to kill themselves for him. There's no such thing as, as sacrifice by death in the name of the Lord. Right. 
And so um, he, this is one of the things that the Bible talks about that, that kind of disgusts the Lord. He has never been interested in human sacrifice except when people offer themselves in life. Right. And, um, and here Ezekiel is talking about how the house of the Lord was profaned by people who were literally sacrificing their children and then going straight to the house of the Lord and pretending to do the right thing and pretending to do what the Lord wanted, but they were mixing these pagan ideas with um, the ideas of the law that, that the Lord gave Moses, and um, that, that just doesn't work. The Lord doesn't mix his ideas with anybody else's because his are the best. The Bible says his ways are higher than ours and his thoughts are higher than ours and that he is the only God and that we do what he says. And so, um, there are, but there are other instances in the Bible where people have made the same mistake um, as far as sacrificing their children for something that they thought was better. And uh, the Lord has been talking to me about this, about making sure that I don't give up a promise of God for a blessing of God, that I don't um, put aside something that the Lord has given me, even as a gift, in effort to get something that I think might be better. And so I want to go um, all the way back to Isaac. And um, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And the Bible says that they were twins, that they wrestled in Rebekah's womb. They were born. Uh, Jacob latched on to Esau's ankle. And that throughout their whole lives, Jacob and Esau were, seemed to be at constant conflict with each other. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that Jacob and Esau grew up in the same house. Esau was raised by the same father that Jacob was, Isaac. They had the same mother, Rebecca. They were twins. They shared a womb. They were conceived at the same time. But these two men turned out completely different from one another. And it, it, it blows my mind that this could happen in a situation where Isaac was a promise from God. And where Isaac's blood and Isaac's lineage would, is supposed to be a promise from God. And so we look at what happens in this life where Esau feels like um, he, ha he has been denied. He is tricked out of his birthright. He is tricked out of his inheritance by Jacob. Rebecca's favorite is Jacob. Isaac's favorite is Esau. And we can see how the parents kind of created this problem. And as time goes on, the Bible says that, you know, Abraham was a friend of God, and God made this covenant with Abraham that his seed would lead to the Messiah, that they would be greater than the sands um, on the seashore. And, and he carries this out, but part of that is not what was supposed to be as far as the Lord's promise is concerned. When people took the Lord's promise into their own hands and tainted it, when these unholy sacrifices were made and messed up what the Lord had given them. Because the Bible says Jacob goes on, even though he did all of these things and stole his brother's birthright, and um, his name literally means liar now. That's what the name Jacob means. And the Lord changes his name to prince and changes his destiny. But Esau doesn't necessarily get the same story. The Bible says that Esau grows up, and um, he's blessed. He has these large kingdoms, and, and his lineage and his children become known as the Edomites. And the Edomites are mentioned all throughout the Bible, even into the New Testament. Um, and it blows my mind that Isaac and Rebekah allowed this to happen in their own house, where one child goes down the path to do exactly what the Lord said, and another goes the opposite and actually creates war with the promise of God. Because when we look at, um, at Esau's life, the Bible says that um, Esau uh, was red. He had red hair, and he had a lot of hair, and um, he was lighter skinned, and Jacob was very smooth. He wasn't a really hairy person, and he had darker skin. And a lot of people talk about how the European nations um, can be traced back to Esau and, and some of, of his lineage. But when the Bible talks about this, one of the first things that happens as far as a couple hundred years down the line, we know that um, Israel, Jacob, Israel, has 12 sons. They wind up going into Egypt because of the famine. After being there for so long, the Pharaoh puts them into bondage. They're in bondage for 400 years. They grow to be this huge congregation of people that are in bondage to the Pharaoh of Egypt, and then God brings them out. Well, in that whole time, the lineage of Esau is still in the promised land, right where Isaac and Abraham were supposed to be, and growing and becoming a strong nation there. So that when Jacob and his children, um, the Israelites, 
have to say Israel now because God changed his name from liar to prince. When Israel comes out of, of Egypt, and um, after they'd wandered around, you know, and, and, and did all of those things that we know that story, the Bible says they come to the Edomites, which is literally their cousins, Esau's lineage, and ask for passage through the Edomite city, and the Edomites refuse. And the Israelites go and they say, well, we're not going to go into your fields. We won't let our cows or our goats or our chickens or anything touch any of your stuff. We just need to go through because this is the fastest route. And Edom the Edomites literally say, we will come to you with a sword if you come into our territory. And these are, these are people who were raised in the same house by the same parents. Two people that were considered a promise of God. But one of them leads a completely different and alternate lifestyle. And how does that happen? I can't find anywhere in the Bible that tells me why. I don't believe that the Lord predestines people to go to hell. But I do believe that our lives affect the way that we view the world um, and the decisions that we make. And something had to happen in Esau's life that he did not follow after the law of God. How, what, what made Jacob decide to do the right thing when Esau went the total opposite way? And now, four or five hundred years down the road, Esau's lineage will, won't even allow the Israelites to pass through their territory. And the Bible goes on to say that um, not very long after that, the Edomites actually tried to conquer Israel to make them slaves. The inheritance, the, the lineage of Esau, tries to make his brother's children and lineage slaves. And the Bible goes on to say that um, two different times, once by Saul and once by David, the Edomites had to be defeated by Israel because they attacked Israel two more times. One time under the reign of Saul and once under the reign of David. And the Bible says that when Nebuchadnezzar comes into Israel and takes the Israelites as slaves, the Edomites are aligned with Nebuchadnezzar and help him do that. A part of the promise, a part of the lineage of Abraham, and instead of supporting the promise of God, they're tearing it down and they're creating bondage in the very lives that is the promise. How does that happen where you have two people in the same house, raised in the same situation, and one of them chooses to make the other slaves? And the Bible says in Psalms, uh, 137 and 7, that the Edomites would destroy the foundation of Israel. What sort of unholy sacrifice was brought that led to this? What happened in Esau's life? What did Isaac and Rebekah do wrong to make Esau's life so completely different than Jacob's? Why does Jacob get to be known as prince? And have the 12 tribes of Israel and David and Jesus and Esau is the exact opposite. A people who are conquered and a people who are constantly at war with the promise of God. And the Bible even goes on to say in the New Testament that when the Romans move in and take over and they put their rulers in charge, that they chose an Edomite to be the ruler of Israel, and that was Herod. Herod, the man who had all the babies killed, trying to get rid of Jesus. Herod, who had John the Baptist's head chopped off and offered on a platter, is an Edomite. The exact same lineage, the same blood as Jacob, but they're destroying the promise of God. And there's another example of this in 1 Samuel, and I want to read part of this, 1 Samuel chapter 1. We know the Bible, the story of Hannah, and how she goes to um, the temple, and she's praying, and she's moaning and in travail, begging God for a son because she is barren, and um, Eli walks out to the prophet and sees her, and says, What's wrong with this drunk woman? Get her out of the temple. And she says, I'm not drunk. I'm just in need. I have a desperate need. And the man of God says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition, thy petition that thou hast asked of him. 
And she said, Let thine handmaiden find grace in thine sight. And so the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more. She went home. She wound up getting pregnant. And uh, she winds up bringing that baby, chapter, verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him, Samuel, up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young and they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli and she said O my Lord as thou so liveth my Lord I am the woman that stood by thee praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I have asked therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there Eli worshiped the Lord there. And Eli raises Samuel in the house of the Lord. In the next chapter, it talks about how Samuel's a young man, and he hears the voice of the Lord calling, and he goes to Eli and said, do you need something? And Eli says, no, I don't. Go back to bed. And a few minutes later, the Lord's calling his name, and Samuel goes back to Eli, do you need something? And Samuel real, or Eli realizes that something's going on, and he says, the next time that you hear that, say, what do you want, Lord? And of course, I'm ad-libbing. But Samuel does it. And we see these awesome things that happen in Samuel's life as he becomes the next prophet of Israel. But at the same time, Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who are committing atrocities on the steps of the temple. And Eli is the, the head priest. And he's doing this awesome job with Samuel, but his own children do such lewd acts in the temple that Eli has to die for it in shame. The Bible says he was a large man and he fell out of his chair and broke his neck. <laughs> and all the king's horses and all the king's men <laughs> couldn't put Eli's neck back together again. <laughs> But here we see the exact same situation. We have Jacob and Esau raised in the same house by the same parents, and they take totally different paths. And now we see Eli raising Samuel in the house of the Lord and teaching him how to become a great prophet, but his own children are abandoned and become atrocities in the Bible. So much so that nobody names their kids Hophni and Phinehas. Nobody. Except the Disney Channel and everything on that's lies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I don't know. <laughs> There's a cartoon called Phineas and Ferb. So it, it, it's crazy that we have this happening in these situations, and we have to ask ourselves, how does this compare to my life? What am I doing in my life that I put so much emphasis on one area of my life and my relationship with God and yet abandon another? Is there something wrong in our spirit when we can come to the house of the Lord and worship and weep and pray and run the aisles, but we can't pay our tithe? Is that not the exact same situation spiritually as what these people are going through? What's happening in our lives when we're being used on the platform every service, but we have no prayer life at home? When we choose to put all of our emphasis on one aspect of our Christianity and let all the other things be forgotten. Did not Jesus say to the rich young ruler, this one thing thou lackest? And sometimes we lack more than one. And we have to wonder, what are we leaving our children? Brother Proctor read about Hezekiah and how Hezekiah did all of these wonderful things in his life and prayed that God gave him 50 more, 15 more years and then he puts the, this, everything that God blessed him with on display and basically takes the credit for it and the Lord tells him, because you did that, your sons will be eunuchs in the Babylon's kingdom's house. And, Nebuchadne and, and excuse me, Hezekiah's response is, well, at least it'll be all right in my day. Is that our response when the Lord tells us to fix something? This is coming down the road. Is our, when the Lord gives us warning signs, are we supposed to say, well, I'm all right now? When the Lord says that the time is coming up and, and, and things are about to happen and, and the pastor is giving you the wisdom from the word of God and telling you how to fix it, should our response be, well, it hasn't happened yet, so I guess I'm all right? Does the Lord have to knock you out of a chair flat on your back in order to get your attention? 
what is happening in Isaac's life that one son is the exact opposite of the promise of God? What's happening in Eli's life that his own sons are abandoned while he raises Samuel in the house of God to become a great prophet? And he does nothing about it. And that's why God was so angry with him. He knew what his kids were doing on the doorsteps of the temple. And he did nothing. And the Lord is crying out to us and saying, you got this and you're doing this right. And I love this about your relationship with me. But what about this piece that you're missing? What about this weak link in the chain? And how is that going to affect you when things get a little bit tough? We talk about our prayer lives and our worship and reading the word of the Lord and our tithe and our attendance. And the way that we talk, our conversation, how many times does the Bible talk about our conversation? And as Christians, we must be able to check every single one of those in our lives. I know why the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. It's a long list. It's a long list. But if we're reading the word of the Lord and hearing what the preached word of God says and absorbing it, and not only hearing but becoming doers of the word, like the New Testament says, then those things will not be a problem. Even today, the descendants of Esau are at war with Israel. Even today, some 6,000 years later, how is it possible but that those brothers could have such a rift? What was happening in that house? What was left out in that relationship with Isaac and Rebekah? That it never stops. How is it possible for Eli's sons to commit those atrocities while he's running around teaching Samuel how to be a great prophet? These are unholy sacrifices that the Lord does not want. God does not expect you to give up a part of your relationship with him. God does not expect you to ignore one of his commandments in order to perform all the others. Because that's not the way the word works. If you're doing it right, it all fits together just perfect. The problem is us. Eli was not taking care of his job as a father. Before he spent any time with Samuel, should he have been spending some time with his own sons maybe? I'm scared to stand here and, con and condemn him. <laughs> that just crossed my mind. <laughs> Woo, <laughs> lighting. But, <laughs> but we see this li in this life that something went wrong. And we can all think about in our own lives right now what our weak link is in our relationship with the Lord. What am I not doing that I have heard preached over and over and over and over? What unholy sacrifice am I trying to offer God and trying to trick him into thinking that I'm okay like the Lord is too dumb to see what we're actually doing? Eli had to fall out of a chair and break his neck in front of the whole congregation because he would not take care of what he was supposed to do. He died in shame. It, Isaac died knowing that his oldest son wanted to kill his youngest son and that his youngest son had stolen the birthright and the blessing of the oldest. And that his wife wasn't going to do anything about it because Jacob was her favorite. Is that what we want our legacy to be? 6,000 years of the Edomites trying to destroy the promise of God? What is happening in our lives right now? What conflict are we creating when we refuse to do what the word of the Lord says? We cannot pick and choose scriptures out of the Bible and pretend like these are the ones we're going to do and we're going to be okay. We cannot see something that we don't like and say we're not convicted over that so we don't have to do it. Because I've heard that before. Well, I'm just not convicted on that. It doesn't matter what you're convicted of. Convictions are extra that the Lord gives you as warning signs. What the Word of God says is what the Word of God says. And this is the book 
that you will be measured by when you stand at the great throne of judgment. And the Lord is going to go down through this book and say, did you perform this part? Did you perform this part? Did you perform this part? What did you leave out? This one thing thou lackest. The scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. To work so hard and change our lives for, and give up all of these worldly pleasures. If I'm going to go to hell, it might as well be in a big ball of fire. Might as well live it up here. Why would you create such a sacrifice only to hear the Lord say it's not holy? Because you left something out. you have given me sacrifices that have been incomplete. I have spoken to you time and again, and you have excused away what my word has commanded. I, the Lord, do not accept your sacrifice. You must hear my servant this night. You feel my spirit at this moment, but when you leave this place, you change your mind. I, the Lord, will hold you accountable in judgment. But today, my mercy still reaches, giving you time. You must heed my voice and offer a sacrifice that I, the Lord, am well pleased with.
Come on, folks, let's find us a place and pray right now. Let's find us a place and talk to the Lord tonight. <laughs> God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't want to miss it in just one point in my life. I have some things I need to work on, and you do too. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
faith is gone. My heart is full of sorrow. I can't believe how much I've let you down. tonight was not for everyone present but I have enough sense to know that somebody here has displeased the Lord and when God sends a message and he speaks he's about to take action and it would behoove someone tonight to change your heart and your ways in the areas that you lack or displease God because before long God's going to take action and the, everyone will know just like everyone knew Eli tonight there's a warning. Tonight God speaks, but yet there's still a little bit more time to take care of it. But I'm telling you tonight, it's just a short time. You better hear us. You better hear this preacher tonight. You better hear the word of the Lord. I do not scream what these young men preach. I correct it if it comes out unbiblical. I had no idea what Brother Shade was going to preach tonight. But it was right on target if I've ever heard, it, heard anything lately. On target. As awesome as yesterday's message was from Brother Proctor, it was not any more on target than today's message. I thank God for sending us warnings before he takes action. I thank God for talking to us and telling us you better straighten it up. You better change it. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's not a God that's just waiting for you to mess up. He's trying to tell us tonight, just turn it around and things can be better in one act of obedience, everything can change. One act of obedience. You have a choice tonight. You can leave from this place and out of anger and frustration, or you can leave this place with a repentant heart and the Lord be well pleased and the blessings of the Lord come your way. I don't know about you, but while 
he was preaching tonight, it was really quiet. It was because that we were thinking about things that we've let go or not doing or things that we that we're that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. And so I would say tonight to this congregation, we need to hear the words of the Lord. Hallelujah. You think you could sing that the song now? <clears throat> sacrifices you ought to see a little bit of scribble to get that <coughs> amen you can do all that with that I need to start hanging around him more <laughs> I see a little bit of scribble on a paper and that's about it Lord have mercy I don't know about you, but I thank the Lord for talking to me. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Amen. 